In the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Yesterday, Hyattsville had its annual city day, and, and there's a carnival down in the Bruder Park, and, and there was a big parade that wove its way through the streets of Hyattsville yesterday with marching bands and, and all kinds of music and, and fun stuff like that. And of course, the, um, the dog doesn't like to march, a lot of noises. Uh, so with the marching bands going by with the drums and the big beast of boom, like this, this was not a pleasant uh, occasion for her, but it did put me in mind that when I was about maybe three years old, and probably right around her size at that time, that I remember being at parades that would come by our house, and, and the marching bands would come, and the bass drums would go, boom, and it would make my, my tummy flutter. And it was it was kind of kind of funny and kind of sweet, but it was also a little scary. And that's that, that's that physical phenomenon known as resonance, right? That everything has a particular frequency at which it will vibrate. And so even if, even if the, the drum is vibrating at that frequency, if my stomach is tuned to the frequency of that drum, my stomach is going to vibrate too. And, and we see something like that happening in John's Gospel. That all of these various signs that Jesus works, all of these various things that Jesus does, the feeding of the 5,000, or, or the, uh, the healing of the man born blind that we heard about recently, or, or um, uh, the healing of the centurion's son, the, the royal official's son, all of those things, they, they all have these sort of echoes that they share. They bounce off of one another, they amplify one another. The conversations that he has with people reflect each other and, and, and recall each other to mind. Like, for example, when, when Jesus says today in the Gospel, he says, this illness does not lead to death, it's for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Does that remind you of anything? Does that remind you of what he said? In, in, in the healing of the man who was born blind, it's not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Or, or look at how many of these episodes involve somebody misunderstanding something that Jesus has said, so that he has to explain, no, that, that isn't what I was saying, There's something different. Here. Like when he offers the Samaritan woman living water, and she thinks he's talking about indoor plumbing. And, and, and he says, no, 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 that's not what I mean. I'm talking about living water, eternal life, welling up within you. Or when he tells the disciples that Lazarus is sleeping, and they say, oh, okay, okay, sleeping is good, yeah? Or he says to Martha that your brother will rise again, and she says, yeah, I know, he's going to rise on the last day. And Jesus has to say, no, that's not what I mean. That's not what I mean when I say that your brother will rise again. Don't you, do you believe? Do you believe in this? There are, there are resonances not only among the stories in the gospel, but you and I can feel those same reverberations between the gospel and, and our own stomachs. Our own stomachs should be fluttering when we hear these things. I mean, who of us, when confronted with some, some catastrophe, some calamity, whether it's somebody gravely ill or someone on the, on the point of death or death itself or, or some kind of serious disaster. Haven't you caught yourself, I know I have, wondering, you know, where the heck was God? Right? I cry to him out of the depths. I wait for him more eagerly than the watchman for daybreak. But where was God when I really needed him? If he'd shown up sooner, this tragedy wouldn't have happened. Just like Jesus took his sweet time going to Bethany, sometimes I feel like God takes his sweet time tending to me and my needs. And the temptation, I think, in, in these circumstances is maybe for us to say, okay, we should be patient, we should wait, wait for God's timing. We urge each other to, be, to persevere and, and to, to hang in there. And we know how well that works, right? And the reason it doesn't work is because it's focused on the wrong thing. It, it, it doesn't work because we're fixated on the problem and on the solution to a problem. We're fixated on what has to happen in order to fix something that's broken in my life. 
And I get frustrated waiting for God the repairman to show up and to fix what I think is wrong with me so that I can say thank you very much and then go back to business as usual, go back to running my own show according to what I think is best for me. But see, that's what St. Paul means when he talks about the flesh. That's that part of us that is, is broken and we can't fix it. And it persists in being broken. And it insists on being broken because it will not submit to God. It will not recognize the sovereignty of God in our lives. But the real point is not about my problems. The real point is not getting my problems fixed. The problem is that I don't recognize as, as Martha had to be reminded, who's standing here staring you in the face, looking me in the eyes and saying, hey, it's me. Do you believe? It's me. I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe that? I'm right here with you in the midst of this trouble, in the midst of this sorrow, this grieving, this mourning. That's a resonance that we miss. The fact that God resonates with us to the point of taking on our own, our very own flesh, to the point of weeping when we weep and mourning when we mourn, and standing with us in the midst of our troubles and being there for us even when we have utterly failed and saying, I'm still here. I'm not going anywhere. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the bread of life. You're hungry, I'm the bread. I am the source of living water. You're thirsty, I will give you living water. You're paralyzed, you're at the point in your life where you can barely move, you can't even get up out of bed. You're so discouraged and so frustrated. But I am here to speak the word to you that says, get up. You can get up. You can pick up your mat and walk and move on with your life. Yes, it's dark in the tomb. It's as dark in the tomb for Lazarus as it was dark for the man born blind. Not only was there a stone rolled across the entrance, but he had a cloth, a blindfold over his eyes. But Jesus healed the man born blind, and he heals Lazarus and restores him to daylight and sunlight and color. Or the man who was paralyzed and could not move, Jesus said, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And he says to Lazarus, who was bound up to the point where he could probably barely just hop, come out and be unbound. Let him go free. Let him walk free. All of these resonances, all of these things that, that should remind us of the fact that these are not stories from long ago that lead us to some propositional statement about who Jesus is, but in fact that who Jesus is is the person who is staring us in the face right now saying, I am here. I am what you need. I am all that you need. Do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life when you're feeling about as dead as you can feel when your life stinks, literally? Worse than Lazarus stunk after four days. Do you believe that he is the resurrection and the life when you are hungering and you can't seem to get what satisfies? Do you recognize that he is the bread of life? Do you believe this? Do you believe that he is the source of the living water that will satisfy everything you thirst for? That when life seems dark and dull and grim and gray, that he is the light of your world? When you feel oppressed and fearful, do you believe that he is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep? Do you believe that he is the gate of the sheephole that allows you to move in and out freely, even amidst wolves? Confident in his protection and his strength. 
Do you believe that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to the end that you who believe in him should not perish, but have life, and not only have life, but have it in abundant fullness? Do you believe this? Maybe your life is, is rotten. Maybe you feel like Job. And the best you can hope for is to curse God and to die. Maybe you can't figure out. Maybe, maybe you're blind to the causes and even blinder to the solutions. Maybe you're like Ezekiel's valley of dry bones, parching in the hot sun. Maybe you feel like the Samaritan woman doing a thankless job day in, day out, all alone in the heat and nobody appreciates it, and nobody knows, nobody cares, and nobody will talk to her. Is life that lonely? Maybe you feel a kinship with a man born blind, and you always feel like you've been second best to all of those people who have sight, but you just can't seem to flip the switch to find out what to do to change things. Maybe you've seen so many other people get healed and move on with their lives, that you think, like, like it says in the song, that love is only for the lucky and the strong, but not for me. The point is that God can and wants to heal those things and fix those things in your life, but the fact is that there is still sin, and sin is abounding in the world, and it abounds in us. But it doesn't matter whether it's my sin that has put me in this deep hole or, or somebody else's, or whether it's just the sin of the world. The fact is that life is standing there right in front of us saying, don't stay there. You don't have to stay there. You can come out into the light, into the sunshine. You can have sight. You can be unbound and set free. You can pick up your mat and you can move on. Because this is for the glory of God. And not for God's glory alone. Not just because God is some, is some picky you Middle Eastern deity who has a complex that, that says he always has to be praised for things when glorified. This is the God. This is the God who shares that glory with you and me, who wants to invite us into that glory, to live it with him eternally. This is the God who doesn't just say, come out and now go your way. This is the God who says, come out and join me. And then in the very next chapter of John's Gospel, we see Jesus and Lazarus sitting at table, eating together, banqueting in a foretaste of that everlasting banquet of heaven. If you believe this, if you believe that Jesus is, is the resurrection and the life and the living water and the living bread and all of those things, and he, that he is in your life and he is looking at you and speaking at you and addressing you directly, then take St. Paul's words to heart. Don't mind the flesh. Don't get hung up on what's fixed and what's not fixed, but on the Spirit who gives life. Live knowing that because of what Jesus Christ has done, you are dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. If you believe that Jesus of Nazareth is indeed the Christ, the one who is coming into the world, then eat that bread of life, drink that living water, open your eyes and see, pick up your mat and walk. Walk on water if you have to. But come to that life. Leave the death and the paralysis and the darkness behind. Leave the, the alienation and the loneliness behind. Leave the hunger and the thirst behind and come out and be unbound. Amen.